So welcome along to our next episode of the Eye Photography Podcast. Uh, you've joined by Stephen. If you've not listened to one of our episodes before, this before, blah, 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 get my words out this today, um, but it's pretty better just to pass it over to Rebecca so you can actually do a better intro. But we've also got Rebecca with us today, another Eye Photography tutor. So how are you doing? I'm not bad, thank you, yeah. And good. And if you're watching the uh, YouTube version of this podcast as well, you've got to introduce us to that lovely little fairy face in the background, I can see. This one is Phoebe, and I don't know if you can see behind her, there is Bailey, and they're brother and sister, so they're only puppies. Oh, and Maisie should be around somewhere as well. So if you do happen to hear any, I don't know if we'll get any barks or such, but there's a postman <laughs> due soon, <laughs> you may get a few grumbles, then that's that, that's the noise, I promise you it's not Rebecca. Um, so what have we got? What are we talking about today? I've got our notes saying that we're talking about, about finding uh, your niche in photography. What's... How would you define a niche really in photography? Um, I think it's it's your little section of the photography world, isn't it? It's your little um, area that you cover, I guess. Um, the more unique, the better, I'd say, because then your style is completely unique. People will seek you for what you do yeah. rather than ask you to do something they want to see, which is yeah. always good. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a kind of... A, good explanation really it's probably useful for someone that's certainly wanting to maybe kind of put uh, or kind of carve a name for themselves in the photography market maybe if you go in uh, professional or just trying to start up a little bit of a side business people start to get a, a bit of a familiarity really kind of a it's like like branding yourself I suppose in a sense isn't it yeah yeah definitely so we've got a few different pointers that we wanted to walk through um talking about kind of what a niche looks like you know how photographers kind of look for niches how you spot a niche in terms of business um you know have to kind of actually start to craft your own niche um, or style photographically speaking uh, and a few other bits and pieces from there as well so yeah we'll just kind of kick off from the top really um talking about what a, a niche is i mean is there any kind of photographers that that you know of rebecca or um you know anyone that you've seen that you find has got kind of quite a a nice clear niche that you can kind of maybe give us a reference um i mean off, off the top of my head i can't think of names but i used to work with a lady who photographed chickens <laughs> and that that was her speciality is, is photographing niche. chickens <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> i mean that that's a, a tiny niche yeah. um but yeah i mean i know you can have a broader niche where you can look at you know I specifically photograph dogs or I specifically photograph pets um and I'm broaden it down that way but you can go as narrow as being I only photograph chickens <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to get in contact with that lady now I want to know where that actually started from but yeah I think you, you're right I mean uh, the first thing that comes to mind um, after seeing her back catalogue is thinking about tutor Emily about how yes. a lot of her work is geared and, and, and kind of worked around alternative weddings. Um, so not the most kind of formal and traditional types, but yeah, she's certainly got kind of an eye for looking for couples that really like the quirkiness, you know, adding in really, really unusual props. But you, you're right, it could extend out to people photographing just one particular subject. It could be ones that uh, like the challenge of animals and children um or maybe mm -hmm. like um, landscapes but only in black and white or landscapes that are very much just one location so you know you get to know it like the back of your hand so there's i suppose there's loads of different ways that you could kind of make a niche really but i it's i suppose it's kind of looking for things that are still important to you maybe that lady absolutely loves chickens and, and that's like, you know that's her be all and end all and that's all she wants to kind of deal with for the rest of her life so why not make her the most out of it really but yeah and I think the niche doesn't have to be a particular subject you know as it will be with chickens but uh, <laughs> another photographer that I love to follow is um a guy called Sebastian Bayen I think his name is and he does this kind of really quirky line work on the face so the, the kind of style of it's the same, but the composition is always different. It's not necessarily always indoors. You know, it's uh, mixed up a little bit as well. So he kind of translates his little niche um, through there. Um, and another guy that kind of has his own niche, which again is not specifically a photography genre, is um, a guy called Ali Howe, spelled H-O-W-E, who does kind of like these amazing composites with um photoshop and even you know prints things off and spray paints them and stuff and um it's just finding that little kind of 
quirky attributes to your photography, I think. Yeah, and, and consistency in it as well. You're right. It it doesn't have to be the subject. It could be the art on top of it or the you know the frame yeah. or the compass. Yeah, I get you get and, and colour as well. You know, um I've known I can't again can't think off the top of my head, but some photographers that always have some a certain colour within their shots. Maybe it's red um or yellow, whatever it may be, but they've always got it somewhere in, in their work. I know like David LaChapelle is a big user of, of colour, maybe not specific ones, but it's always very heavily saturated. His work is heavily contrasted. So yeah, it could come down to like how you edit your pictures as well, keeping that consistent. Yeah, definitely. Um, but kind of, why would we say why do photographers look for niches? Is you know, is it an important thing for everyone to have, or why why do we think people do it in the first place? I think there's a couple of reasons. I mean, for me personally, if somebody approached me and said, "Would you photograph my child?" I'd probably pull a face that says no. <laughs> but <laughs> um, so it's eliminating things that you don't want to do. Um, if you uh, let's take Emily again as an example. Um, she could photograph a traditional wedding and someone could come to her and say, you know, we're getting married in this church and um, we want this very formal kind of structured wedding. But the likelihood is that that's not her style. That's not what she's going to enjoy doing. So I think finding your niche really helps you find something that you enjoy. Yeah. So if someone come to me and said, will you photograph my dog? I'd be like, yes, amazing. Let's do that. So that that's what, what you look for, I guess. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's a nice thing that it's it's cathartic and it 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 motivates you more knowing that you enjoy the subject matter itself. And I think on the flip side, as looking at it as a business, um, you know, if you're wanting to try and stand out in a busy genre, so again, using Emily as a, as an example, um, wedding photography, I imagine, is quite a saturated market for many. So trying to kind of be different and appeal to you know some people that are getting married that don't want the traditional look. Um, you're effectively kind of capturing a market that isn't already being serviced. But it's also, like you say, it, it, it's maybe to give people a place in their own, you know, because there's millions, I don't know how many photographers there are in the world, but, you know, there's hundreds and thousands, millions of them. Um, so trying to do something that somebody else isn't doing and make you feel that your images are even more special, I think there's an appeal to that really as well. So whether, yeah, you're doing it for fun or for business, there's there's different benefits of it really. But when it, I suppose actually comes to kind of picking up the camera and, and taking those shots and creating a style. Um, I mean, how, how do you approach your work? Do you have a, a consistent thing that you always look to try and do? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to do a lot of research into my um, ideas and things. Sometimes they just kind of hit you in the face, but other times it, it comes from seeing where others have not necessarily gone wrong, but where you change things that they've done or you know, things that inspire you in that sense. Um, and also sometimes if you think of an idea and then you do research it and there's no information, that's a massive niche. You know, just because it's not there doesn't mean it's not wanted, it's not popular. Um, for example, I'm looking at doing, so I do a lot of photography with my aerialist friends, my gymnastic friends. And an area that I wanted to try and look into was the kind of um, George Mayer Avenue. So he does a lot of shadows and basically nude, but with shadows. So it's quite elegant and hidden and classy. Um, and to find another photographer who does anything like that in the gymnastics world, there's, no, there's none at all. So in that sense, I couldn't find any inspiration, but at the same time, it meant that, you know, there's a, there's a calling for that, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. The, the research is, is such an important factor. That's one of the things I've got on my notes and that, you know, if you have a look at things that you just like, as you say, whether it's gymnastics or dogs or chickens, I'm going to keep coming back to that chicken <laughs> all the time. And literally I would say, you know, a good process is almost like writing down a list of features and elements and things that you like. And you basically start to build up a list of what your ideal photo looks like. So whether it's uh, kind of bright and light or dark and moody, colorful or black and white, whether it's intimate or widespread, busy, kind of simplified, there's, there's different ways to do it. Um, but ultimately, I suppose, writing down all those little elements, it helps, like I said, build a picture of the different things that you like to have in your photographs. And you may not be able to get them all into every image every time, but at least you've got a kind of a direction that you want to achieve because some of it can be used and done in editing. Some of it has to be done in yeah. camera. Um, but yeah, I think you're, you're spot on to say there's, there's a lot of research with it. And I mean, you can come to then 
I suppose if, if you know this editing is a big part of it, then I mean, do you use presets a lot, you know, to, to kind of help consistency? Yes and no. Um, if I'm batch editing something, I will open the first image, have a little play. Um, I'd always export it as well because sometimes it looks different on your phone as it does on the computer. So I'll I'll use one image as a kind of template, and then whatever settings I've done for that, I'll I'll create my own preset and apply that to the rest. Um, especially if I send contact sheets, because as a photographer, you can imagine the outcome. So recently I shot, um, some of my friends do aerial hoop. So I shot that with a black background. And obviously it's it's never black because you're adding light to it, you're adding flash. So it looked great. So on the day and on the back of the camera, it doesn't look that impressive. But when you edit, even if it's just a quick five, 10 minute edit and apply that as a preset to them all, sending over a contact sheet changes the way that other people see your images as well. Um, so I definitely, especially if you're new to it, I'd say have a play with presets, but the more you get into editing, I prefer to create my own for each kind of, each day, I guess, each, each photo shoot, because, you know, I could go back, I've got um, the preset from that day, for example, if I shot the same thing today, it's likely that I've set the lights differently at different angles, or, you know, there's always some sort of variant, so I'd still start afresh each time. Yeah, I think you, you're totally right. The presets aren't, well, we always say they're not a one-click solution. Um, and also, I would say that they shouldn't be kind of used to kind of save an, a bad image. You know, obviously, you've got, like you said, you've got to get your lighting right. You've got to make sure your composition and everything is as, as good as you can get in camera. And then the presets are there to, I suppose, enhance it a little bit further. And I'll let you say, you know, if, you, if you're always uh, kind of, you know, always shooting black and white, I suppose, yeah, you could use kind of a preset, just kind of push black and white through it, but then maybe go through each image and, you know, make sure you've got the tones as best as possible. At least it keeps that like black and white feel throughout them all but you've still got to serve each image individually and make sure it's, it's done to the best of its ability. But I mean, when, when you get to a point that you've got a style, so whether it is, you know, you, you've, you've got a nice kind of workflow of black and white images, or you've got a nice kind of portfolio of chicken photographs or whatever it may be, <laughs> um, you know, do, is it a case that photographers should kind of like stop and then go, right, I've, I've found my style. I'm, I'm kind of quite happy. I'm just going to do this forever. You know, do you think there's, you know, people should just kind of carry on or should we kind of then maybe just use that as like a, a springboard, you know, for inspiration to then go further? I suppose it's, it's two different ways you could look at it, but I mean, how would you see it? Yeah, I mean, yes and no. I mean, if you've got your own style, you've got, I say you've got a plot. I'd always look at improving yourself, changing things up. I mean, for your own sanity as well, if you did the same thing day in, day out, you get fed up of it. Um, so I definitely push yourself and try new things. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and again, you know, don't just stick to your one niche. I mean, if anyone looked at my portfolio, they think I, I was mad because it goes from gymnastic shots to portraiture to dogs. It, it's just, <laughs> but as you said earlier, the, the key factor in it all is that I control the lighting, I control the setup. It's shot how I want it to be shot. They probably do have a similar editing style as well. Um, so it's finding those kind of key things within your photography that makes it easier. But I'd still, I'd still always push. Um, I mean, there's a few eye photography students that you've seen really do well in one area. Um, I mean, I hope he doesn't mind me naming him, but Tim Archer kind of comes to, to my mind straight away is that he started off doing newborns because he had a newborn son. So that was an interest of his. And then when the kid got a little bit older, he started taking him to the zoo. And his zoo photography was insane. I mean, his his baby photography was good, but the zoo photography was even better. So I would, yeah, keep pushing yourself, keep trying different things. I think the world of photography is endless. And it's if you don't try new things, you just get bored of it, won't you really? Yeah, you, you're so right. And I think you you hit the nail on the head again with 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 Tim. And, you know, I've seen it with, with many others as well, that your photography is, you know, if you're not maybe professional, your photography is guided by how life is around you, whether you work, your family or whatever it is. So yeah, it maybe gives you the opportunity to try out different things, whether, because I've seen a lot of eye photography students that um, have become grandparents. So they've got loads of opportunities to be photographing their grandkids. So they're kind of trying out new portraiture, um, but then they're maybe kind of getting out a little bit in outdoors kind of come the summertime. So 
they're trying to let a bit more landscapes or florals. So, so yeah, I think, you know, you, you could potentially apply a style uh, to different things. Like you said, they may not work. It may not work with everything. Um, so don't kind of necessarily force the issue, just kind of do the best for the image. But, but ultimately, yeah, you've got to make sure whatever you're kind of photographing, it, it's part of your enjoyment of it, really. But, you know, if yeah. you do want to use it as a, as a base, let's say, once you've established a niche, um, you, know, you can start to kind of add extra things in. I've written a, just a few little notes about maybe even adding in colored gels and see if like adding in different colored gel lighting could be interesting. Again, it may not work at all, but you've got to explore and find out um maybe kind of get creative with some crops and i think as you were saying before with um uh, was it andy how arch archie how ollie how yeah how all right okay (laughs) but like mixing media so you know you're taking an image and people do like painting effects over the top um so there's, there's loads of different things you can do just to either kind of keep consistency or add another little kind of extra flourish on top of that ultimately as well so I think it'd be quite interesting to know if, if uh, you know, if anyone's tried to kind of craft a niche, anyone that's actually listening into this, who's in the middle of trying to find their own niche and, and you know, what they, what they kind of have found that's struggling with it, you know, and how easy it is or where they get their inspiration from. I mean, do you go to any particular places to kind of research images? I know it's obviously tricky in some areas of gymnastics, like you say, but is there anywhere yeah. you, you find kind of quite useful generally? Yeah, I mean, a mix, really, of kind of Instagram or Pinterest. Um, You know what? Instagram's got a really great feature where you can search for a hashtag and save that hashtag search. So they start to appear on your newsfeed then as well. So things like aerial photo shoots or dog photo shoots, um, I have saved that appear on my feed regularly. Um, And again, Pinterest is just full of fantastic ideas. I love it. So addictive. (laughs) <laughs> oh, massively, yeah. And I found the now in Instagram, they've got an option that you can actually save a pin. Uh, sorry, save a pin, mm-hmm. save a, like a post. Um, and again, you can put them into albums that, similar to yes. Pinterest. So yeah, again, if you prefer to use Instagram over Pinterest, etc., then yeah, you kind of got similar little features and you can always go back to them and just use them as a, I suppose it's like a little scrapbook really, isn't it? Just ideas. Yeah, like a mood board. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and and I think... I mean, especially working with people, it helps me to have a mood board so I can show people and say, do you want to do something like this? So they get an idea for it um, and and give them some inspiration too. Does it work with chickens, do you think? (laughs) Um, They might have a little cluck. (laughs) (laughs) That's a successful one. I want to find out who the lady is now as well. We talked about her so much. We should give her some exposure. She was pretty local. I think she was um she was definitely Cheshire area. That's crazy. I need to have a look for that anyway. Need need to find out as well. But maybe maybe someone can kind of write in and let us know kind of what the weirdest niche they've ever seen in a photographer <laughs> is. We've got to give a I have actually again, I don't I can't remember the name. It's someone I've seen on Instagram, but they um photograph their hamsters with different kind of like cooking utensils and scenarios so they like build the hamsters a little house and put aprons on them and things you know if people if people into hamsters then that's fine Oh my god! I Why not? These. I have to I literally. You know, be, <laughs> but I'll have a scour of the internet and try and see if we can kind of find any links for people if they're if they're listening and you want to know kind of what a hamster looks like with a giant spoon <laughs> or some cooking utensils. Then we'll we'll do our best to kind of find it for you anyway. But but if there is any kind of niches that that you know you found you know as you've been listening you know or you've been inspired by by another photographer, then get in touch. We'd love to know you know where you find your inspiration, kind of how you see these niches, you know, and how you even craft your own as well but i think we've got one or two other um podcasts that we've done in the past that talk about kind of how to find inspiration or maybe how to use pinterest i think um kind of for finding that inspiration so if you want to uh, listen back to that then have a look back through our feed wherever you get your podcasts from um but in the meantime we say thank you very much for listening uh you know hopefully it's helped you understand what niches are how they work really really well uh, for a photographer whether it's just you're just doing it for fun or you're trying to do it more on a business side you can kind of find us on uh, the normal social medias facebook's instagram youtubes if you want to get in touch with either myself or rebecca and if you head over to iphotography.com forward slash podcast i think that's our new link isn't it 
Uh, yes, that sounds all right. Yeah, and uh, on there you've got um, special offers uh, available for some of our iPhotography courses if you want to do a photography course online, plus some of our products and our amazing plus memberships. So um, yeah, check that out. Uh, all the links will be in the description as well. Um, but it's been fun, hasn't it? It's been kind of quite a nice. Yeah, the, the drops have been surprisingly quiet. <laughs> well done. They're very cute to sleep. Yeah. They are, oh. honestly, if you're, if you're listening to this and you know, just listen on, on the podcast player, then try and jump over to the YouTube version just just to see them. I think he's actually kind of heard his, not, heard his, uh, his yeah. name. He's just like, heads up, looking around, what's going on? Is that me? Oh, back to sleep. Back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that sounds like it's the end of this episode. So thank you for joining us. Keep looking out for us on the next one. And we will see you soon. So thank you. See you soon. Thank you.